all right so <clears throat> let me show you something a little bit so um i've shown some bit about our programming and then um, this time i told you that i'm taking project so i was just doing some <clears throat> some analysis and i decided to also let people feel this now you see that when you are doing pan genome analysis you see a lot of uh, you're going to have a lot of output different files are going to come up let me show you one of them let me show you how they are there's a way of visualizing these files so i'm just going to come here so i have so many files here now when you look on the panel here i have something called rolly results yeah so i just ran rolly and then these are the results that came out right so you can have something like ancestry uh, ancestry tab ancestry binary gene and whatsoever how do you visualize these uh, tabs i mean how do you visualize these files that have been generated obviously if you pick any of these uh, uh, files they wouldn't make sense to you for instance one of the most important files here is uh, uh, gene presence and absence yeah it's actually for instance you are dealing with so many uh, isolates let's say bacterial isolate that you have uh, isolated from patients and you want to know uh, what the genes that are present there and which one is present in the sample and which one is not present there so you run your rolly and then you get this kind of output but you need to have a pictorial uh, what is the term view of it so that's what i want to do uh, today so <clears throat> when you have files like this um you can see there's one here called gene presence and absent r tab so it means we can actually visualize this in r programming or in what is it if you know how to use r so i'm going to show all of us how to be able to do that just in five minutes all right so when you have it like this r tab means that we can actually import this particular file into r so if i go to r studio right now uh, i could just come to r studio here i could just say that let me import this particular file and then I will just import it so i can come here let me just roll this down or I mean, let me shift my panel small so i can just come down here roll this down uh, come here and say maybe import then i can import but this time around <clears throat> this i what is this uh, way of doing things is a little bit bulky for me so i don't do that any longer so what i do is i just uh, whatever i just create a variable let's say that i am going to deal with uh, gene presence and absence so it's gene presence an absence which is going to be my variable uh, so let, let me come to my console here and just clear it so that i can have a plain ticket so if i come here just roll this up uh, okay so i can also have plain ticket so i'm going to come to the first place just say that i have my uh, gene presence and absence as my variable and so i'm just going to do this and say that read dot because it is you notice that it is dot tab so you can only tap means table you see so it means that you have to use uh, the read dot table form to be able to import it but if you import it in the format in which it is and you are not uh, you know conversant with our programming you're going to have a lot of issues so what i i, I normally do i normally advise is that when you have it like this you can send this particular file into excel so how do you do that so I'm just going to what is this, open it with my notepad. You see, this is how the file actually looks like. You see, with this 1100, it's difficult to visualize this kind of data, but it's actually categorical data, which is very easy to. And so you have the first column here, which is made of a gene. So for, what I normally do is I just copy it. I just highlight everything like this. Control C, copy it, and take it to my Excel, and then create a CSV file there. So I've already done that, and then that CSV file is here. I've created it, which is now here, as you can see. I have my uh, it is here it is gene presence and absence one csv file so it's csv so if i go to my r studio and i want to uh, bring that particular file there i just say read dots um, uh, cs so that should even come csv and then what do i do i just say file dot choose and then if it say file dot choose it allows you to go to your this and then if you run this it will just take you to my so it takes you to my desktop and then i'll choose the file there so if i come here i know that i save it on my desktop when i come i look inside my desktop and see where i have my gene presence and absence obviously my desktop is arranged in alphabetical order so i should go to the g so here it is so if i click here like this then i can come and click open and then uh what is this i'll, I'll have it just registered over there but for the sake of time i've already done that so i'm just going to scroll up 
explain how I'm able to visualize. So first of all, I used that and I created this variable. So this MF means uh, microbacteria for teaching and then gene presence and absence variable. So I use the dot. So I'm just going to do this, run it, and then I'll come here. Then I'll come and click this, click open. So it's now over there. So, but you want to have, you want to check and see if, uh, what is it, the file is is, 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 is actually there. So you just click, uh, you want to just look at some few parts of it. So head, uh, you can, when you do head, you can just add to it. So I don't want to look at the first three rows. Then you see that, is you, you can see that the file is actually there. So the next thing to do, you just want to check the class of the data. It's actually a data frame. You can see it down here. It's a data frame. So, and then uh, we want to look at the summary. Mostly we do the summary to be able to know whether there are any, uh, you know, not available. So if you do summary and everything comes, it means that uh, uh, you don't have any. So you can see that the summary, everything is there. So these are inbuilt functions. Uh, uh, so if you look at the structure, the structure gives you all the information. If you've been following my tutorial, so you will know that we actually have uh, about 11,833 observations. And then we have 23 variables. And then out of that, one, the, one of the first variables is a character. All right. So it's important to know that so that you know that when you are dealing, we are, you are dealing with the integers, you can put the character there. So and the rest are integers. So that's quite OK. So I'm going to go back to my. So that's what the structure will do. But now this particular uh, uh, file, what I've written here, uh, I want to make the gene column the column that I have, which is made of genes, that particular column, I want it to be an index column. Index column simply means that even though it's part of the data set, but it's not, it's not going to be, uh, uh, be, or it's just standing outside as names, ordinary names. So when you look at this rule, what is the name of that rule? So we normally use something called rule names, and then you put the whatever. So I want the rule names of this variable I've created, which is my data, what my data frame. And so, and then what I'll come and simply do is that, but I'm not looking for all of it. So what I'm simply doing is that I'm looking for just uh, MF, uh, GPA. Uh, so I'm looking for this data set and this specific gene, uh, sorry, this specific uh, column. That's what this particular variable, which is called gene, that's the column. So I want that one to be made names. So those ones will not form part of the data set now. They will only be like names. So if I run that line, so that works well. Now it has changed this. It will definitely change this. Now, the other way of doing what I've just done on top here is by running this whole of this. So uh, I just have here read.csv, then I have this particular code here. That's the name of the file, gene presence and absence one, the one I just imported from my desktop. And then when I'm importing it direct, I just say that row.names, I want the first column, which is called gene. That particular column should be row name, so it doesn't form part of the data. When you run that, you see that it runs properly. Now, if I come here, and I mean, this one, this particular code, I'm not going to run it. So I'm just going to hide, uh, comment it out because I just wanted, I could just remove that particular column. So what you normally do, you select that column and then you run it with now. Then it will simply just uh, remove it. Now we have this one. This, if you check the structure again, now you notice that you won't see character again. So I'm going to check that again to see. So you see that all the variables are now what? Integers. You won't see any character again. As compared to the first one where we had a character here, now we don't have any character. They are all integers. So we are good to go. So we move a little bit. But it's in the data frame. If you want to visualize a data of this magnitude, which are categorical data, it's always good to put it in matrix. You see, so that you can find the correlation. So what we normally do is, uh, as matrix, because it's a data frame, I have to convert it into matrix. And this is the code we use. So as dot matrix, then you put the name of the data frame or the data variable inside here. And then I created a new variable, which is gene presence and absence. So if I run that, I've converted it from, uh, oh, I'm, I'm told that there are some X variable somewhere. Okay, I mistakenly highlighted the X, so it ran only the X. So I need, I need to, yeah, so that runs properly. So now if you check the class of GPA, uh, uh, it's no longer a data frame, it's now a matrix as you can see it in the console here it's now a matrix it may have converted it so now that it is a matrix i can now visualize it i can visualize it so one of the ways to visualize i can use this particular rule here and that's it will come with all the default but i want to say that 
I want the column variables to be to give me a class ring, and I want the row variables to also not give me any class ring. If I want, I could have added class ring, and I want the scale to uh, to what it to be at columns. That's all. So the scale will be based on columns. That's all that I wanted to do. I could allow the scale to be based on rows, and then, uh, but I decided to make it to be based on columns. So that's one way of running it. That's the one way of visualizing it. Another way is by using the heat map here. And then, so you simply just put the data, the name of your data variable, which we have created, the matrix, and this is a variable here now. So I just put that variable, the heat map, and put it in brackets, just run it. The heat map is a function. If I run it, then it will simply generate my heat map for me. Uh, another way of is using it this way. Another way is like adding different colors and whatsoever. All these things, they're just like me to just polish it. So let me run the first line and you see how that one is going to look like. So that one, it will come with all the default that heat map comes with. But let me say that heat map generates, uh, I mean, is, is a huge set of data, about 11,000, sorry, about 18,000. That's a lot of data. So if you want to run, do make sure that where the plot will appear, that particular panel is always wide. If you narrow it up this way, it will tell you the margins are too small. It won't be able to enter, so it will run. So that's why I'm widening it up like this. So you just drag it this way and leave only a small space for the line, and then you run it. So if I run, I'm going to run that now. And so so if you check here, you can see that it is working. If you see this red line uh, where I think here, it is working. If I want it, it will stop. And if you are listening, you can feel that my computer is now kind of vibrating. Because heat map is kind of a lot, is computational. The computer will have to do a lot of permutations to be able to come out with the whole map for you to see how the interaction between your samples and then that of your genes. Where which particular sample has this gene, this gene was present and this gene was absent, and then in that order. So when it is finished, then the heat map will simply appear on this, and then we can visualize it. I'll just be, be able to let us see how it is. Uh, uh, it might also be possible that it will refuse to run because if all right then here you are so you can see that now the heat map it has generated and so that's what i was talking about these are the clustering for the columns these are the clustering for the uh, the rules and then that is it so the rules represent the genes here the columns represent the the isolates here so these are these are real-time data i'm analyzing i'm just speaking this how to and so you can see that uh, we have uh, the names of the strains that have been isolated from pneumonia patient, isolated from different different patient, and then I'm trying to find out whether with these particular genes I have uh, I have I have already isolated or I have already generated using my other bioinformatics tools. So which of I mean which of these samples contain these genes? And so the heat map will give me. I know that heat map usually we are looking at uh, the intensity of the color. So you can see that where you have a very thick color like this then it means that the genes are concentrated there. If you have a very light color, then you will know that the genes are less concentrated around that particular place. And you can correspond to that particular gene. So if we see that this particular group of genes here, or, or sorry, this particular group of genes from where my cancer is down up to this point, you can see that they are much more concentrated in this particular sample, uh, which is was isolated in a Japanese uh, uh, woman. So you know, that's how we are able to be able to visualize uh, gene presence and absence, uh, what is it, which is always generated by Raleigh. So if you want to know how Raleigh may, what is it, do this kind of, Raleigh is actually a bioinformatics tool. You use it together with Proca and then uh, what is Scory and then you are able to do a lot of work. So thank you very much. And that's how we are able to visualize genes absence. I've already shown you how to visualize in the week. That video is there. This is also one. There are quite a number of them, how we are able to visualize or how to be able to use R to uh, do all some of these things. Thank you. I will see you some other time. Um, the last thing, uh, let me say, so when you have it like this, if you've been following my tutorials, you can just come and click export. You can save it as an image. You can save it as a PDF file, or you can just copy it to Flipboard. If you want to look at it well, you just come and click on Zoom. I'm not too sure the Zoom, okay, then the Zoom comes, then I can widen it up here, but that's going to take a little, some, some few minutes. All right, here it is. And you can see that you can now see the what is it the 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 listen the data set or I'm saying the data the image quite clearer and then you can just export this I can just do this I can copy it as an image right I just right click and then I copy it as an image or I can copy the link address to the image then I put it somewhere and then download it straight from that place all right so that is how we are able to visualize gene presence and absence uh, using R.
or in our studio. I think the most important thing you must not forget is that you should know that when the data comes, it comes in the form of uh, it's mixed with characters and then integers or numbers. There's no way you'll be able to generate this together with the characters because uh, 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 characters, are, unless you change the characters into factors, that will be able to do this. But uh, as it was, no, the, those genes, the genes were characters. So find a way and make sure that the genes are out. But in that kind of um, uh, what is it analysis, you can't just allow the genes to go out because you want the genes to also be what it will be the names. So what you normally do is you keep them as row names, if it's possible, and there was something you don't also want it to be part, then you can keep it as an other name. And so usually, what we normally we call it like indexing. You use it as an index column. So index column means it's just hanging out there. It's not doing anything, but it's part of the data set. But when it comes to computation, the algorithms and the functions will ignore that and then compute with only the integers, the numbers, and then the figures. But it won't, it, won't, it cannot do anything with characters. So that's why I had to make that particular column an index column by making it the names of the rules. That's why we now have it here. If I didn't do that, you would have been having only this this bottom part. You wouldn't have been having the genes, and that would be useless. You see that here there are genes. Uh, genes are concentrated here, but you won't be able to tell which particular gene is concentrated here. But now it's easy to correspond to those genes which are on the right hand side of this. So, thank you. That has been your video of this night. Uh, I hope you've learned something small. Uh, this analysis is quite interesting. Anytime you are able to get your results out like this, it's so interesting. So, that is it. Thank you. I'll see you some other time. Bye-bye.